Morning, everyone, and welcome to the November 17, 2023 Long Range Planning Committee meeting. Uh, um, this morning, our first item on the agenda would be the review of minutes of October 13, 2023. Any comments on those minutes? I just have one, and it's not a biggie. It's on um, underneath staff updates. Um, <clears throat> the Transportation Committee public update was held September 26th and not the first week of October. Just if we need to be particular about that. But okay. That's the only change I had, but I wasn't here. We'll get that note. Anything else? Fitting. We have a move to approve. Do we have a second? Either seconds? And again, if there is any discussion, now is the time. Seeing none, all in favor and all opposed, I show that to be unanimous. Thank you. Item number two is review and discuss chapter 405B site plan standards and commercial design standards merger. Update the draft architectural standards and draft site layout standards. I'll turn it over to April. I used to have a secretary named me. Sorry. It happens all the time. That's why I'm used to just stop, stop it. it. <laughs> um, thank you, Alan. So in your packet um, are two different attachments. One is uh, the architecture that we started talking about last time and at the end of our meeting, we sort of all decided we really needed to focus on how we wanted the buildings to be on the lot before we worried about how we wanted the buildings to look. And so this is just a capturing of all of our existing site utilization and layout. Set up the same way um, the black text is from chapter 405 site plan review. The blue text is from the commercial design standards. I did not print it, but I sent you the commercial design standards. So far, we're down to 70 pages. So when we did lighting, we reduced it from 92 to 70. And so we're whittling it away. Um, but it didn't include that, that for today. It was just to show you the red lines of what was captured from that. And then green again is proposed. And then for this uh, meeting and discussion highlights, um, it's just having questions and ponderings and things we can go through. So I've organized it the way that we have organized the um, the other section, lighting and landscape and the architecture that we've been working on. So it has the purpose, uh, applicability, and just general standards. And I don't know if you all had a chance to review it beforehand, but we can go through the purpose statement really um, I don't know if this is still uh, viable and it's something that you want to continue to use or we should have a different purpose statement for how we want the layout of commercial properties to be, uh, but this is what we have now. And then for applicability, Eric and I had some discussion internally about this. Um, so this one's really about placement on the lot and where your parking is situated. And so, for architecture, we consider doing it for existing when it gets redeveloped. But I wasn't sure if we wanted to go that way with this because depending on the level of redevelopment, it's you're not going to rebuild the building closer to the road, say. So I, <clears throat> it was just a little discussion. I just wanted to have with you that this is really probably focusing only on new development for commercial and multifamily. And then maybe we can sort of put a pin in it that we need to also talk about redevelopment if that has any change. So two things. Um, the first is the question is the purpose, purpose I guess. Um, it looks good to me on its surface. I don't see any issues. I'm wondering are there other purpose statements from other towns or from other cities that would be different, interesting to compare and contrast to. I, I, I again, on, on its surface, this feels like mother of an apple pie, but I don't know how to react to what might be something different. So, um, but uh, so I'll put that there. Um, on the applicability, I, I think 
I hear what you're saying. It feels like new or substantially altered. Um, and, and I know that that's a, sort of a fishy term, but like if you had a building that had a very large extension attached to it, now that feels like new construction. Um, even though the original building or the original facade may be maintained, but you stick a two-story thing on the back end of it. Um, I don't know how you put that in crisp language in here. Um, and I understand what you guys are getting to where, it, where um, uh, renovations per se mm -hmm. probably don't be fit under this, but okay. it feels like there's a way to well, the footprint yeah. changes. Yeah, you know, that, yeah exactly. the, the footprint expansion may be over 30% or something, and that new part has to comply. Yeah, I, that I was going to say that for the, um, uh, for, for uh, I think about the zoning, um, zoning, if the building envelope changes by more than four or five percent, we typically start to look at it very differently than if it's just a a very small or minor extension of the building footprint. Yeah, so something like that would be maybe something we would look at. Well, and, yeah. and I know with my parents' house, it got into volume too. They could not expand yeah. more than X Y Z volume. Sure, while they were still, and that applies to for impervious cover building for coverage. Okay, but I think that's fair. Some sort of building expense. So it's new. Commercial multifamily or an expansion, and oh, an expansion, yeah. So it's not renovation or you know you're painting, you're doing facade yeah, changes, yeah, but it's when you're building a certain percentage to the account. correct. Okay. Well, and there's other ordinances that come into effect as well. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're within shoreland zoning or the, mm -hmm. the, the, there's limitations there in terms of that. But. This is really, and we're going to see this show up. Probably in your B two and your BOR and um, TBC Long Route One and yeah. so those districts too. Okay. And so yeah, the green language, otherwise in applicability, is the same language that we've been using. I did take the provisions of this section. Um, we have a mixed bag of um, standards now when it comes to light industrial and industrial. Some things apply and some things say they don't. So. Um, these would not apply to light industrial or industrial zone developments. Is everybody comfortable with that? Does that make sense? So then we get into the general standards. This is from our site plan language. Um, could, could I just point out on the first page, the uh, second paragraph in blue, uh, districts, commercial districts that uh, apostrophe. Oh, yeah. Come on. Mm -hmm. Oh, in order, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have a call for five minutes at eight thirty. Also, step out for that. I just wanted to give you that as a okay. yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, general standards. This talks about um, sort of stuff, really filler. Um, principal buildings should be oriented in the site that's compatible to neighboring structures and develop a pattern in the vicinity. Position to provide an aesthetic and functional relationship with sidewalks and streets. Um, and then we have this blue language is from our commercial design standards. Um, buildings should be located as close to the front property as line as possible. But then in bold, you know, yellow zoning setbacks should be like this. So our zoning setbacks are really contradictory to this. For instance, B2 is a 50 foot front yard setback for the building. So if you include your right of way, your sidewalk and everything, and then you want the building to be 50 foot, but you don't want to park in front of it. it and, and you'll notice that 50 foot is the amount of space it would take for a drive out of the one row parking. So you know that's just something we should probably take a look at our setbacks because they they won't work together. Yeah. It's hard to encourage it because we require that. I so prefer the language of the blue here to what's implied by our setback policy. Well, setbacks are not a policy, they're required. Yeah, no, that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, exactly. if we do the blue and we want to keep it, then let's also talk about setbacks. Yeah. Is that, yeah, that we'll have to make some recommendations to those as well. Nothing easy. What is there? that be resolved by something along the lines of provided that zoning setback shown 
take precedence. Well, I no, think we I think we want to change the zoning. Yeah, I think we want to change the zoning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because for the commercial and the okay, that's what I think we want to probably I settle. I don't those think, have a and I, think, I don't think those zoning setbacks reflect the implicit design standards that came out of the, the comprehensive plan process, right. uh, or the um, yeah, or the so yeah, that's that's what I'm I'm here for. So. And, and this is another discussion about setbacks, something we were talking about in our office the other day with, with Brian. And so commercial districts have this lot coverage requirement. They have this lot size requirement. Um, and it's really counterintuitive to development and redevelopment. It puts us in this weird spot, especially along Route 1, okay, 200 foot. Um, you, have to, you have to have frontage, so you can't really have any anything creative or interesting. So I'd really probably like to look at our commercial districts and the setbacks and the bulk standards if you all fairly soon as we go through this because it, they have to come together so they match. Um, yeah, we looked at one yesterday actually that they would they have enough frontage, they have an existing building, but they have space in the back, which is perfect for, and the use is allowed for an additional development, but there's no way our ordinance doesn't allow them to have shared access to a separately owned lot, an entity. So they would have to um, put it in a condo regime or there's it, just, it's just sort of, it's a little older, you know, it didn't contemplate current things. And so um, I think it's a good time to look at that too. If we talk about setbacks, um, I guess one of the questions that I have has to do with what is considered the front of the building? So let me give you an example. Um, if you go up to the gallery board, we have a little bit of infill there, right? So you've got the main store, uh, the spot I'm thinking of, and I can't think of the names of the stores, but- Oh, this is the, where the- like Jersey the Bikes and that is where Jersey yeah, Bikes yeah, and yeah. stuff is, right? So we've got infill there. Now, is the front of the building considered the roadside, or is the front of the building considered the parking lot side where people enter? So those buildings would have dual frontage. You're supposed to treat both sides facing the road um, as the front of the building. So okay. even while you might not have entrances, we have a bank on the planning board on Monday. Autumn struggles with because. Um, it's facing the internal road, but their entrance is actually sort of facing Gallery Boulevard, which looks really nice from Gallery Boulevard, but from the internal where everyone's actually accessing, not so nice. Um, but you're supposed to do both sides. And that's what we've been talking about in architecture standards, okay. that we want to make sure that, uh, and we also <laughs> talked about last time, what we see a problem with Walgreens is, is while it looks nice and it looks, um, it's on the corner, there's no access to the corner. So it doesn't, and that one's, I think Walgreens is special because it's set so low. I think yeah, that's there's, there's a, there's a because, weird elevation. Yeah, I think the elevation change is what makes that. But I think that's what we're trying to grapple with too, if we want um, access from both those corner lots. Yeah. So, and you can do infill parking lot development really well um, not like, I don't know if you all are familiar, there's a really bad example that I go by often on exit 32 through Bedford. They have like five guys and different things. And oh. the back is like the back door and the sign. I'm like, oh, that was just bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whoever did that, that was the poster child for, we tried and it failed. Um, but you can do it. There's other examples of doing it really yeah. well. And even allowing maybe a row of parking so you actually have the frontage so you have one group of buildings facing gallery boulevard and one group facing the other you can do some different things so. well I, I think one example of something that probably went a little bit better than that is golf and ski mm -hmm. so where along haggis mm -hmm. you it, have that nice you know it looks like an entrance, but it's, but it's not, not right. Right, but it. I think that was a pretty good example of something that wasn't too bad in the terms of that. Yeah, and that's a good day to do a job too of focusing the entrances to look towards the residential growing multifamily units there, which I think is nice. Yeah, and encourages a sense of of village feel for that that development as it grows. But no, I, I agree with that. Yeah. 
we, we had a we had a struggle with the uh, new Starbucks at the gallery yeah. um, yeah. because the basically the the line goes the the car queue goes around the back of the building which fronts on Gallery Boulevard and we just kept looking basically for more landscaping. Sure. Uh, and that the back would be at least visually reasonable um, because it made sense to have, given the plans that were coming, ultimately going to come through, I guess, it made sense to have the entrance into the parking lot, which was already there. Is, is, it was a way to accommodate the removal of a lot of impermeable surface yeah. um, at the same time getting rid of some of the parking lot and some of the emptiness that people would see as they, they went by. So sort of shrinking the parking lot to something and Martin's to something that's actually reasonable mm -hmm. because now there's new development in there. So right. technically they, there should be an entrance to the back, but you just finally said, doesn't, <laughs> isn't gonna work. Yeah. On the other hand, they proposed um, when they originally came before us. They proposed a building facing uh, Payne Road. Now, yeah. when they do that, we have options and ability to say, "I'm sorry, really, you, you're going to have two entrances um, because you can drive down past um, the front of the building on Payne Road, but get you know through the parking lot." And at the same time, you can have parking in the rear. So that's not before us. It was just something that they had planned once the Starbucks building was, was completed. They had talked about what they would like to do next. And that was um, so that's when we're going to have to then make a decision around what's back, what's front, and how to handle that along Payne Road. I think one suggestion that I made last year as well. Um, when you get to the point in this process of what you were describing about yours and Brian's conversation mm -hmm. about your farm, if you have image mm -hmm. A, image B, uh, I think it will uh, focus the conversation. And I didn't lose that. I just no. didn't have time because well, <laughs> I think that well, I actually, there, yeah. yeah yeah I think once we get some pictures especially for the architecture I've been trying to take some pictures of the building so we could talk about transparency but I haven't gotten there yet no and I, I we I mean even stick with your representations and okay. things, but, or otherwise just send the drafts of what you might be talking about Perfect. it's very interesting to listen to everybody but it's so, easier to make sure everybody is. I get an image yeah. when yeah. Rachel talks. I get an image when Alan talks. And then mm -hmm. we need some common starting point. Yeah. Suggestion. Only. So, does everybody yeah. agree that for commercial development in the entire town, the building should be close to the road? That's what I'm trying to grapple with, too. Is it sort of the same look we're going for everywhere in regards to that? So that we're getting the building up closer and the parking's on the, at least the side and everywhere else. Yeah, yeah. Okay. which is why the answer to my question is I'm not sure we should have a um, bulk of the hangar. Maybe I'm misreading this. Yes, I think we should have a maximum yeah. setback. Okay. Yeah, agreed. So that we discourage. Well, and yeah, require. Yeah. Okay. So that we don't have parking in the front. If that is at all possible. Okay, because so. that I've written several mixed use development ordinances in the last 20 years. And one of the key things was this is a maximum setback. So right. Minimum's like, okay, cool, I'm behind it. Then I'm gonna keep going. And then oh, I need to put my parking here because my building's back. So, right. Okay. That's so what's an example of the maximum setback? Uh, so if the minimum setback was 10 feet from the property line, the maximum would be 15. So you don't have enough space to put parking. Yeah, or it doesn't have to be that extreme, but that would be a maximum. So you have to be in this this window mm -hmm. so things start to match, if you will. So we have some really nice buildings on Route One that have been developed over time, but they have different setbacks. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, or drive aisles or parking or and if all I drive down Route One every day a little different, but oh, if that building's up and that one is up yeah. and that one, oh, that would look really substantially different. From the stretch from basically Scarborough Downs Road to Hattie's Parkway, yeah, you got some nice buildings, nice buildings, but they're all over the place. Yes, <laughs> there's, there's, there's no consistency about well, how no they line up along the way. Right. If, yeah. If we had somebody who wanted outside dining though, uh huh. Should we have the ability to have that setback further, depending upon the use that they want to put in the front of the building? They could do, if they were going to do outside dining as part of the structural to their building, that would count as their setback. So, and if they just wanted to say, I'm going to have a paved area and put some chairs on it, then it wouldn't work. But if they had some structural element, a, a pergola or a covered canopy area, that would count as their building setback. Right. Okay. So that right would... across the street, we have an example, right? Yeah. At O'Reilly's. So... Right, right. Now, O'Reilly's is just a little fence, so that wouldn't. Their building line is their building. Um, but they still, I would, I would argue that they could still, they're up close. Vision is not much farther back than Scarborough Ground. Scarborough Ground does the same thing. All right. So, do we need to define an architectural source or, or a feature that would qualify for? Feels like a waiver to me, Alan, <laughs> in architecture, that you could get some relief maybe from the maximum setback requirement if you know, these things. Yeah. That's the way we could address it. Right. We've been thinking about things. So, Autumn, is there a, I'm trying to think if there's a situation where the lot constraints, sure. because of, you know, um, physical features, wetlands, whatever, sort of creates a narrower sure. band. Sure. Is there relief? Are we building in relief for that? I think we should. Those? Yeah. I think this first thing was, hey, should we look at this this way for, if it was easy to do, do we want the town? Okay, now let's dive into how, and sure. I think there's definitely some- I would caution is building that. relief for wetlands, though. I mean, I, I think wetlands are, we're, that, that, uh, just in terms of what we might build relief for, I understand what you're getting for, but wetlands are uh, semi-sacred and- Oh, uh, I'm not talking about building in wetlands. I'm talking about if the lot has, you know, because of the configuration of where the wetlands are, it, it narrows that building envelope. So they're not building in the wetlands, they're still um, doing a lot Well, and to that point, we're working on environmental standards of conservation that's going to potentially, if adopted, adds increased um, setbacks to wetlands. So that we do want to make sure that that doesn't contradict each other. Yeah, um, I guess I'm going to be the, the Grinch. Um, <laughs> We have people who buy lots and then try to put something too big on them. Mm -hmm. They know when they buy the lot what the size is, or when they put an option on it. They know where the wetlands are. And then they come to the planning board with something that is not a design that really is not suitable for that lot, and then say, well, we need a we need a waiver. And I feel like saying, why did you buy the lot? Yeah. Why did you buy that lot? knowing that what you yeah. wanted was going to require us to crunch here, give here, change this, and drive the planning board crazy, trying to help them come, come to what they wanted to do. But the, the lot just doesn't work. So as soon as we start saying, oh, a waiver here, a waiver there, no. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no. That's what I'm getting at. I think we can do it. I I would prefer that our um, impervious cover was lowered about by 15% for yeah. every zoning district. And then that would be when the realtors and everyone calls and they see that. That's that, that's a big, oh, okay. Because 85 is quite high for most of our districts um, that you can have impervious <laughs> cover on. And 85 is really too high to do all the other requirements, the stormwater and the landscape. It's really tight. And that's why I think we get a lot of that at planning board. You can just barely do it if you max out everything. So I think if we were to decrease that, we'd have fewer arguments. Um, but that's all. Really, there's some 
like industrial has a now it's this, much lower. This doesn't apply to industrial. Right. So this doesn't apply to LI. No, I'm just talking about land, yeah. land coverage. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's weird that our industrial park has probably the lowest I, of the uh, yeah. land coverage. Yeah. yeah. So this is this really we're talking about commercial zones, right? So all commercial development and then multifamily development. I will bite my tongue in response to your point, Rachel, which I agree with. It touches on, I not want to bite my tongue, it touches on a bigger, much bigger issue, in my view, and correct me. But um, when you're in a township, that if, my, if I go back to uh, my memory about Broadway musical, something, uh, something along the lines of South Pacific, I think, there's a song in there that I'm just a girl who can't say no. And when Scarborough has a reputation of never saying no to develop developers and the purchases that they buy land wise, that's what I'm reminded of is you run into this situation where the town has a reputation of granting such things. And you know, let, and, and, and let me just respond to that. And, and that is that, yes, we try not to say no, but we also enforce the ordinances, and it's been a fair number of times that the developers have said, well, we're going to take this back and look at it, and we don't see them for five years. Right? In other words, we didn't say no, but they realized how much it was going to cost them to, uh, com to come into compliance with our ordinances. So, so I, I don't know what our reputation is, but we do have people who just <laughs> wander away. We I, I will say that is that is not the interpretation that I get when brokers call me and realtors call me. That is a lot the understanding. Trust me. I, I get that every single week. We somebody have calling me. <laughs> well, that's not, I stand correct. Yes. Delighted to do so. I have one more question. If you want to have the parking in the back. Or, or, not, or not in the front. Uh -huh. Is the front supposed to look like it's the front? Yes. Because I want to park right in front of the front door and get, make, get the shortest distance from. That's why you walk there. So the entrance is still going to be in the front. It should be in the front, and there should be a really not just the appearance, of it. right? It should the be in the front, okay. sort of how Maine looks in a lot of communities where you drive along and there's the front, you park around and you walk to it. Okay, that's yeah, okay. Okay. All right, let's see. And then just some basic, there's a few definitions in the commercial design standard. Some of these probably won't even need to be in here once we get through, but I just copied and pasted for the time being. And then we'll probably add some definitions as we go on. Um, so then we get into site access, location, and design. And so this is how cars get to the site. So again, the black is site plan standards. It's basically just some general things. Let's be safe and you can get in. Um, we have, uh, let's see. So there's a table that exists for driveway access separation. Um, and that's down here. So we have the separation in feet from driveway to driveway, 90 feet, depending on the speed. There is a waiver that exists now. Um, and I think it's probably good to keep it, but it needs maybe to have some other language about it. There is, and then we continue on. This is all pretty, pretty standard. Um, this one is something, the sharing of street or driveway access is between sites should be incorporated whenever feasible to limit curb cuts. Um, I feel that we should require it. So good example, Atlantic Credit Union on Route 1, the mobile station is to its north. There's potential for access, and they couldn't get it to mobile, but during the site plan process, we made them Evergreen. sub out to Evergreen. it. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Evergreen, wrong one. I'm sorry, Evergreen is in the wrong place. There. Ever, Evergreen Credit Union, the new one mm -hmm. being built. So we did require them to stub out to that mobile. So while it won't be 
there's probably going to be a pretty fence there for the time being. When mobile comes to redevelop, we will require them to step out. And so then there will be connection. And then that mobile entrance could be closed and Route 1 could be safer and the medians could be included. So it's hard with uh, development, but I feel that we should probably be a little stronger in this language. So any new development, it's required to stub out. It's kind of the sidewalk to nowhere, but eventually the sidewalk will connect. Eventually the drive aisles will connect. Can you legally do that? You, you can. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean you're, yeah. you're basically requiring to, I mean, I, I'm just- Yeah, you can. Out there. <laughs> okay. yeah. It's standard stuff. Because um, theoretically it would be within easements. Mm -hmm. You create the shared okay. access okay. easement with your site plan and it's there for the na the neighbors. Okay. Yep. Okay. There's language. No, I think it, it's having shared street access. Street I think that's the only street. way over time too, you really decrease those curb cuts and you sort of create. Well, it makes the job easier for planning it, forward too. It so does. Um, yeah, the, in, in the, um, the Liveaway Hotel or whatever on Monday Road, mm -hmm. um, closing a curb cut and they're exiting through the next property over, which right. puts them exiting at a stop line. Yeah, they're actually closing two curb cuts because the homes okay. have two. So that is really an improvement for, for traffic yeah. and walkers because they're going to have a safer right. sidewalk. Right. <laughs> It's amazing how much easier that gets when you're connecting. Right. Yeah. All right. Almost all these safety issues go that, you know, like the liveway would have been previously huge on Muzzy Road. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. We so have... we're going with required for now. Oops, sorry. I I think so. That's right. Yeah. Then we go into why am I sorry? You can you can do it. Let's see, we have some design language about how the road, I don't think any of that honestly will be changed. Uh, internal vehicular circulation. This is another section that we have existing today. It's pretty good. Um, it's about the lane width, the drive aisle width, how the, based on how the parking is set up. So if it's one way or two way. Um, Drive driveway slow. Uh, this is some language from the commercial design standards about internal traffic flow. It's pretty good. We have traffic calming measures shall be included where appropriate to discourage speeding within the site. Um, it's just sort of general language. Okay, and then we get into minimum parking required. So it's interesting, the zoning ordinance talks about uh, what's actually required per use. The site plan um, ordinance refers you to that, so we can keep that. But then the site plan ordinance is where we talk about ADA requirements. So again, big picture, this is really for the planner nerds and all of us. Someday all of these things will be together and it really makes sense. Um, but for the time being, just sort of piecemealing and trying to make them coincide better. Um, so this is just accessibility requirements. And then we get into parking lot design. So this one, um, this one, we're striking some information because it's covered in landscaping. Uh, can I go back oh, for yeah. a moment to the minimum parking required and ask again when, when we're gonna take a look at uh, yeah. a combination of things and one of the maximum allowed not maximum parking allowed um and not counting off not counting on street parking as credited to the parking for a site the planner in me has a problem with that Rachel I don't care <laughs> that hurts my planner heart I don't care. <laughs> just put it out there See, she's Says no, Marvin. Says no. So we can talk about that's a different way. That's, that's, I, I, I don't, I that, don't care. It's my middle name. That's, 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 that's one of that's one of those things that I think I've beaten Dan Bacon into. So I think you okay, but I the downs is written so that all that on street parking does count because that's the type of development it's supposed to be. Don't care um, because it eliminates a parking for visitors. Yeah. 
No, I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, um, so I just want to know. There's a whole national to movement to do away I'm with Bernie Sanders. Right. Uh, right. But no, I totally, I understand, you know, driving around last weekend in Vermont and Burlington trying to find a parking. And I get it. I, I get there's some contradictions. Well, there should be some competition for visitor parking. We get one of the you want it to look full and exciting and like everybody wants to be there. Yeah. Uh, Fine line. At what point do you start charging? What's that? I don't know. We'll have some sort of decision meters and things of that nature. That, that, believe me, that takes care of it if you, if put, you, if you, if you, if you stop charging. And I'm on your side. <laughs> so if you could charge, could you count it? I mean, no. we digress, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe. So, I mean, that's really up to you all. Parking sort of falls into this. I am comfortable. All of these things are on my whiteboard. So I am comfortable taking them with any. There's no charge for us to do this one, this one, this one in order. We're just sort of having these discussions and making it happen. Um, I'm comfortable. Uh, FYI, they're running into this in a time point. And there's going to be a recommendation for charging for mm. all parking street. Uh, otherwise, it's fine for to control that. And that's sort of East Grand or yeah, everywhere? Everywhere okay. past the bridge. I mean, I'm not, they haven't finalized. Yeah, yeah. I sit on but that. But that's little their thing. recommendation. And I mean, yeah, that's the newer process in, mm -hmm. in, in parking, um, particularly with congestion management, is having meters that can adjust for time of day. Sure. So there are times of day where, yeah, there's, you know, it's free. Oh, that's, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. congested um, area. So that's that's part of the traffic management movement is to, to look at that and, you know, manage the congestion. And Higgins Beach does it already. I don't know if they have. I'm to... not talking about time of yeah. day or okay. year. They just have on street sure. parking. I don't think you can wire private property owners to charge your parking. No. Space. Right. I, I think what Rachel is in the Downs, they have a lot of on street parking that it's in all right away, but they count it towards their parking requirements for their development. So the it's. Roads in, in, yeah. yeah, as they get accepted. Yeah. All right. So um, yeah, so so if a building is supposed to have sixty spaces, right, and they only have room for fifty six, then they claim that the four spaces on the street are theirs for purposes of parking. Except is you know I think well, but that's a public street, and those are you know the public might like to use that. Um and so you're going to yeah. find another four spaces in the back of your property someplace. Or come to us and talk about hey, you know, especially as we get right into the downtown. Right. I think there's actually a great solution. So we have minimum parking standards that are maybe outdated. Right. And so we have two again contrasting sort of situations. We have minimum parking standards where you have to have maybe two spaces for every multifamily unit. And then we want on-street parking too. So maybe if we address what's required minimums and then we say your on-street doesn't park, count towards that, but our minimums are more reasonable, then we have maybe the best of both worlds. So we're not having that argument. Because to your point, the on-street parking, I, as a resident, that's not gonna be my parking space for my apartment but I don't need three spaces for my apartment either. So maybe there's a reasonable approach. So it sounds like fun for February. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything on the side of the house? Yeah, and, 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 and just possibly for the folks here in terms of the three I apartments, we really didn't think that the residents of three I should have to find space on the street. If their parking space, if their lot was was filled, because they didn't quite have, from our perspective, enough slots back there, they really did a good job examining what was needed. Uh, because that the three I is sui generis; it's the only only building of its kind, right at this point in the United States. So they they took a really hard look at how things could be done and then worked with us and worked with themselves on how how it would happen and they've came up with and we approved it 
basically a three option parking plan. Option one is what's going in, but they showed us how option two would work to provide more space by some restriping and a couple of other things, and option three by moving a lawn uh, and adding more spaces. Moving a what? Pardon? A lawn, L-A-W-N. Oh, yeah. right. um, the um, So it, it worked, We because we really weren't clear how much they were going to need, but we were really clear that we didn't want folks parking on the street or trying to find parking a block over. Um, so there are things that can be things that can be done, and and that's what we've been trying to do. But constantly saying, "Oh, well, we're going to count the street." Uh, no, but I, I like the idea of really taking a look at the standards. Okay, Let's great. Down. All right, I'm gonna put that on the list. I still want maximum parking, but go ahead. <laughs> you want what? Yeah. Maximum parking. Okay, I like that too. Um, just a, a question on the the ITE standards that are you know for the relationship between parking and I think it's ITE it still does parking and businesses. When they do those calculations, they're assuming a certain amount of visitor um, mm -hmm. parking as well. So that the parking that at least the the national standards include a certain amount of visitor parking. Just double checking that it's not just if we. I honestly couldn't. I, okay. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, because parking is the, just I such a hot button everywhere right now. Right now. A spirit. lot of places are doing away with it. Is, <laughs> yeah, totally. I was how they um, how they get the the new one going to put that on there. I think they assume the visitor parking is on the street. Okay. Well, well then you get snow storage. It is a pretty developed so, urban and, and area. And so say you want to it's walking yes. and there's parking available. Um, Say downtown Biddeford, if somebody wants to go in and redevelop a lot, not making them do on street or on site parking, parking can be a development. Parking. It's really cool. A development yeah, incident. We're not trying yeah. to build that picture, sure, but that's use the thing. network. Now, that's for us who have sort of had developed suburban right. over time, that's okay. 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 Not, yeah. we're not yeah. going to that. Yeah. A lot of communities, a lot of larger yeah. places yeah. across the country are really yeah. trying to. So we'll do that. Yeah. Is there a park Everywhere. I'm Derek. He's really good at it. <laughs> he's, he's like the expert from going to Portland and finding random places to park. <laughs> um, but yeah, just taking advantage of what you have. But you have to do some serious soul searching, I think, in this community. You have to do an inventory of what parking you have, what's free, what's paid, all that before you start there. But it is sort of a a national sort of movement to really reevaluate what you find because we don't. Uh, the great example is this Walmart needs, needs a huge parking lot. Costco, Rachel say maximums because of cost. they have seven hundred and sixty four parking spaces. How many times I'm going to go by it every day and take a picture? <laughs> And well, today is not the right day. Not, not today, today and not Black Friday, but you know, just the random Tuesday that we really need to park for the maximum situation. And so that's where people are coming from. I've never seen a Walmart parking lot full except for well, look two days. Yeah, and, yeah, and that close the great example is the worst thing a lot of gosh. And, and a lot example. of redevelopment <laughs> opportunities. So if we decrease the parking standards and had these maximums, then Cabela's, and they could do that now. They could totally come in and do sort of that um, Starbucks where Martin's right. and infill and really are start and, really and they will. They're it, really it'll happen. happen. But that's where the national is really small. Yeah. And, and, and in the case of, of Costco, <clears throat> it's the most recent in my mind, um, the uh, what the planning board really doesn't have the ability to do is say no and demand that they um, not develop some of the parking spaces, although they might be held there for the future. Mm -hmm. so it, it's that hold for the future comes at the request of the developer. The developer says, we don't need this much, but we can show you where we would put parking in the future. The planning board should be able to say, you don't need this much. Mm -hmm. Take this 
space right. as future development and come back when you prove that you need it. And, and that's not within our purview. Sure, yeah, well, I agree. So but these are cases where they've met them that are required number they want more. Yes. Yes, uh, 164. I remember when we when I was on the board, we approved the entire warehouse place. Oh yeah. They didn't want to have as much parking as the ordinance required. And we ended up agreeing that they would make the lawn area on the side of the building. The, the, the other the surface would support parking, <clears throat> but we didn't require them to pay them. Yeah, right. The surface it, like you know, it, designated I, for future parking or something. And, like and we can still do that, but it's at the request of the client or the developer that, that happens instead of the planning board looking at it and saying, You haven't proven that you need right. 600, 794 spaces. Is that what happened with Costco? The yeah, we we they needed X number of spaces by ordinance, and they wanted more. Yeah, they wanted something like 160 more. Yeah, anticipating right. Chris Chris. But the great thing is, if we increase our impervious cover requirements, yes. they couldn't. They couldn't. Right. So the right. problem would not even be a problem to, or a question to ask. Well, ever. or maybe <laughs> we need to look at at um, permeable. Yeah, that's what I'm talking surface about. Surface tree. Yeah, yeah it's, that's, that's our. If you're going to do X Y Z over, then it has to be a permeable. Yeah. I think we have issues with permeable paving um, <laughs> in, internally. <laughs> so, but yeah, I think um, you can, you can hand, if you tackle it from this side and this side and it all makes the same thing, uh, it's a much easier argument for planning board because it doesn't even get asked. It's just understood when they have a pre app with us. Oh, your maximum impervious cover is 60%. You're way over parts. Fix it. Yeah. Oh, and we have maximum parking standards now, so you can only go over 15% of your required, and our required is more reasonable, so try again before the board even gets it. And then you need a pathway that people can walk down without getting run over. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go back to this one. Um, so I removed all the landscaping requirements that were in the parking standards because we're covering them in landscaping. Um, and remind me to talk to you about landscaping when I get to staff update. So then we have some statement about shared parking is strongly encouraged. And again, I think if we start talking about our minimum parking standards, we'll probably touch on that as well when shared parking can count. So- um, Now, how's that, John? You said earlier about prohibitions on shared parking. I street said parking. Earlier. On street parking. Oh. Shared parking, good. Street parking, good. So our so parking fun. lot behind my building. Can I give my neighbor yeah. a piece of rights to use X number of spaces? Well, not you you can try, you can right now. Okay. Uh, but you have to present it. It's not really outlined how you do it. A really good example, I think, that we've seen currently, uh, Allagash. So Allagash is going on the side of Market Street. And this doesn't matter because both of them have enough parking, but Allagash is going on one side of Market Street. Their hours are going to be you know, X, Y, Z to this time. And then across the way, we have an office building that's going to be like an eight to five sort of thing. So I'm excited. There's overflow parking potential across the way, and there's a really nice pedestrian crossing. And so we're set. And that's a great example of how a developer could justify shared parking or just well, utilizing. Uh, and the fire station development, of got what the name of it is now, but the yes. Avesta, that um, is based on shared parking. Mm -hmm because it didn't otherwise didn't really have the space. So there is the arrangements for shared parking and we'll see how that works. The but the situation you're talking about is the same space doubles for two different right, users, right. versus 100 spaces in one lot and 50 allocated to the mm -hmm. building. So, so how do you deal with the fact that 15 years later, the use of the building, which was here, is now here. Mm -hmm. And the shared parking solution no longer works. How do you deal with that? Or they'd have to come back to the board for amended site plan. Right. And Unless we decide. Um, and, and that's something I internally struggle with too, is we have different parking standards for different uses that can go into the same building. Right. 
And so it seems, I, I think we should have more general and generic retail parking standards. So if you want to go in and read, um, and, and most people, that's what they think. They think they call up our office and they get a CO inspection. They're going to do a new finish out. And then, whoa, lo and behold, you need three more parking spaces. But you're on an existing developed site. Um, it's like a doctor's office it's, going into. Yeah, or the doctor's office was parked for the doctor's office, but now it wants to be a cafe, you know. Right, and, right. So I think when we get to parking standards, I'd really like us to focus on making more generic and general parking standards so we don't have to worry about that. Okay. Uh, but the shared access agreement would be an easement that's reported. So that would live with the property. Yeah. That's how that would work. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So this is all decent stuff. This is parking aisle width and parking angle degree stuff. Those engineering things. Um, on that, you know, and I'll ask Rachel too. It wasn't one of the issues with Costco is they wanted oversized spaces. Mm -hmm. So do we have any? Is there going to? What do we do with that? Yeah, if we're going to. Well, the, the oversized spaces is basically allowed. Um, and when they ended up um, reluctantly having to put in the walkway for the pedestrians, they took a whole row of the oversized parking spaces and shrank it. Okay. And that gave them the, 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 the space enough to put in pedestrian safety walkways. So uh, they ended up with the same number of parking spaces. Mm -hmm. They just trained. Mm -hmm. okay. And there again, use, I think, makes a difference when you're dealing with grocery carts and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. For, versus pickup trucks and the giant things that you load, you know, the loading. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does make a difference. And if you go to Harbor Fish, for instance, and try to park over there, if you aren't absolutely within those lines, you can't get out of your car. Harbor Fish. Oh, the, they the should be nine there. by eighteen. Well, they're very, they're very tight, particularly the last two. Oh, and so um, somebody should go over to there. Um, Eric, so, I, I was actually gonna, so when you when you I'm going out there later today. <laughs> it is it, only and, one person can get out of one side because uh, the normal nine by our requirements are for a nine that's by eighteen, it so it should be a minimum. It's very, it's very tight. Yeah, that whole site is really tight. Oh, yeah, and that's an example of a redevelopment that had to fit within. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's another sort of subject. So never mind. Yeah. we should continue. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I have stories, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that one uh, the, that one's a redevelopment. So then we have the dead end parking language that we have, and we use this a lot where you have to do a hammerhead um, to get back out. Uh, and now we're into pedestrian access, and I've divided this into general and then internal and then public, I'm trying to capture all the ones that we have. So this is really all about um, walkways, internal. I think all this is or this is just general. And then you get into the internal walkways that Rachel was mentioning. Um, so I've highlighted this language that continuous internal walkways shall be provided from any existing or planned public sidewalk. I feel like we should get away from this planned public sidewalk and uh, future public sidewalk. Should, it should say that because there's gonna be one there someday maybe. And that's sort of rethinking, um, that's just a conversation point. We, we get that often when they come to our office, we talk about, well, we want sidewalks. Um, well, where does it say I have to do them? Because there's this study from 2005 and blah, blah, blah. We should just, we want sidewalks. <laughs> they shall be built or pay, be in lieu, and figure out something. But um, that's just, we're moving in that direction with our transportation committee and our uh, pedestrian and getting people out of their cars. And I mean, we just, we have some, some growing up, we got to just say we want sidewalks. What, if we want sidewalks. My, <laughs> my biggest beef when I was on the board was crosswalks, mm -hmm. without question. And I would love to see language that says not painted because I'd much rather have some kind of a textured sidewalk 
so that you can actually see it after three months. Because when you look at crosswalks that are painted, they disappear. And I would love to see them textured in some way, shape, or fashion. Are you talking about internal? Uh, yes. Pedestrian internal? Yes. So that, you know, you can, there are ways to texture that. Right, right. Even if you use porcelain. So you can even do. Yeah. You can do brick. You can do stone. You can do all kinds of things that are there permanently. Painted crosswalks are a waste, in my opinion. Let me ask you, um, should there be a traffic sign there as well that warns a pedestrian crossing? Should that be a requirement? Oh. Because, you know, when you get a lot of snow, yep. and all of a sudden you've got a crosswalk that's covered, that's no matter what the texture is, is. Uh, filled with slush. Um, should there be a sign at each crosswalk that identifies the fact that it is a crosswalk and the traffic, well, the type should, of traffic? Yeah, sign? it should probably be texture and painted and a sign, right? Hey. And so maybe that's what you're, there's, you kind of capture all the, the I guess part of the weight is part of what safety and wayfaring. Mm -hmm. yep. well, I think that's crosswalks crossing a street that you don't like the painted. Right. When they're textured, there is a risk of the box for the box. For streets. Right now, I think we're just talking about internal. I'm talking internal. No, street, no, no, I'm street. not talking like, streets. So main on campus. Correct. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Just... Internal crosswalks. <laughs> and I agree with the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to Public works have to help me with their, what's acceptable because we we do get into that a lot for um, pavers and whatnot. I mean, yeah. I've, I've seen pain wreck where what they do basically you know, this is excessive, but if you go up the highway, right, you get the you get the rumble zones. Yeah, you could do something similar. Obviously, not so deep, so you can actually have pavement. But they groove it and they make patterns in it. Yeah, you can see. And it's level. It. It's the grooves that mm -hmm. makes the texture. Yeah, the problem with that is on okay, so that's over time. water collects on the grooves in the winter. It creeps off. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. it causes work out. It's a huge maintenance problem. Whereas perfectly smooth or you know, cement section or something is easier to maintain. It doesn't. I'm fine with that. I'm looking for something different. Yeah. All right. You want, you want to pave it with cement? I have no issue with that. I'm yeah. just looking for something that is permanent. I mean, with all these things, I think you have to balance what we ideally would like with what is realistic during New England weather. It's a whole lot different mm -hmm. building stuff in Atlanta yeah. where you don't have. Five feet of snow, yeah, and salt, and you know, I mean, because that's paint. why we lose our paint too. Yeah, well, that's that. that what's that paint that they use? That it's like a plasticized stuff. Anyway, I just think you have to be a little mindful of the wind and weather. Hmm? It's like our snow plow. You know, we don't really probably don't have a lot of good area in a lot of places to park for snow. Go to Hannaford after a big snowstorm in the big piles. They melt, but yeah. but is it realistic to say to them, you got to have another 400 square feet of paved surface to put the snow? The same argument we had on park. Mm -hmm. You really want to want to curve the surface. So I think you got to appreciate what you're saying. And it's certainly yeah. on a hill up with our But I want to say, but I think we have to be a little cautious. Perfect surface. The requirements for this. Yeah. across the um, sidewalks, what they made them. I hear that. No, no, no. no, 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 no. I just, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking what a developer is going to say. I know, for example, there's a big, they just created a parking area at Piper Shores for what's considered the bus garage. Right. But that's all pervious pavement. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so down to the bus. Yes. Yep. 
So you can solve some of this by how you approach it. So you know, where do they have it? Maine Health, because Maine Health is very concerned about obviously about pedestrian movement within there because it's a medical complex. Yeah. And I just can't remember what is there for crosswalks. You mean up here? At the yeah, at the main at the main health campus. Not much. Okay, because I was just there. I'm yeah, curious sure. whether or not they did anything there. And didn't it used to be a Kmart? It did. Yeah, but so they, I, there's like a lot of them. areas in that parking lot where you're walking <laughs> in a driving lane okay. yeah. with no crosswalks. Okay. And the only place is right where one entrance, the 100 entrance. There's 80 that parking. Yeah. Okay. okay. So then we have. Um, on the width, we've got something at five feet, something at four feet. Yeah, um, we do. So the site plan standards have four feet, and the commercial design standards have five feet for yeah. internal walkways. Not really sure why those don't match up. But I can double check what the ADA requirements are now and see if, if we want to keep them at four, if that's what it is. Or if we want it to be five feet, that's okay too. Or maybe there's two different scenarios. Maybe there's a minimum width, and then if you're going to use shopping carts or things like that, you know, because it's different walking into a small boutique versus Walmart or mm -hmm. Sam's Club. Just with that, I would. People passing each other. Mm -hmm. Or it's narrow. It feels narrow to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Constantly, people would, if two people are walking together, all of a sudden you have to get into a single file or feet. Mm -hmm. And somebody comes. And they have to step off, but yeah. Nice finish sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> or you never know. <laughs> people are bigger now than they used to be. <laughs> I wonder the the new sidewalks that um, you know the dance is putting in all around are those four feet or five feet? Five feet. Yeah, I think five feet is okay. Reasonable. Let's keep it five. Then. Um, let's see, now we get to oh, we have this too. Um, within larger parking lots, where the main building entrance will be fifty foot. 50 plus feet from at least half of the parking spaces. So this could happen even if the parking's on the side. So that's good. Um, these walkways could be separated by parking bays and travel aisles, by raised curbing or landscape buffering. Um, these are five feet. Yeah, so five feet makes it yeah. consistent. And then we have location of walkways. That makes sense. Okay, so then Alan, we have internal crosswalks shall be provided and marked by a change in pavement, texture, pattern, or color to maximize, maximize pedestrian safety. The materials selected should be highly durable and low maintenance. Raised crosswalks shall be considered at key locations with a traffic calming device. So we still to have what you're talking about as well. Signs. Uh, I think we should keep signs from commercial design standards. That's what to Rachel's point. So I think we have pretty good information. And then we get into pedestrian access, public sidewalks and crosswalks. So now we are at the commercial site and we're getting onto the sidewalk. So great example is um, the old Wendy's is turning into a bank and there's a sidewalk on Route 1 and Hannaford Drive. How do we get the people from the bank to that sidewalk and vice versa? So that's what this one's talking about. Um, so this language about <laughs> the long-term objective is to encourage an interconnected network of sidewalks that encourage exercise for the general population. It's sort of old and yeah, you said to me. So I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna rework that. Yeah. That's not a good it's yeah. not good, right? <laughs> We just want you all to exercise because you're bigger now and you need five foot sidewalks. <laughs> oh, right? like, I, don't, I don't think that's the message we're trying to send. So we'll work on that. Um, but then we have, where this is the blue, wherever possible sidewalks and planted esplanade should be provided with them near the right of way. I think that's all fine. Um, and encourage pedestrian traffic versus something else. I something. As a for exercise. I, I don't think you should strike. Yeah, I, I think well, like her objective is to, um, yeah. is to develop an interconnect. I was just wanting to work on this long term. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, other than just saying exercise, you know, the yeah. other reason. Yeah. 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 Then we have um, public sidewalks should be provided wherever possible throughout Garble's commercial mm -hmm. area. So again, this is that whole language and we always get, it's not possible, sorry. <laughs> um, and I, I think that we should probably strike this. So and shall be provided. Shall be provided. Um, and this is just me throwing out an idea. I'm not even uncomfortable with saying that if there's already a sidewalk in front of your property and you get to benefit from someone else or the town doing that, that you pay into their fee and lieu for a sidewalk. Like, so if you buy my property and I already put a sidewalk in, I don't, I mean, I don't know. It's just something to think about as we look at our transportation master plan and all the missing links that we have, maybe that's a potential to make it more equitable, um, especially maybe on some corridors where sidewalks are missing, or it may just be too much and it may be, uh, maybe you're paying for that sidewalk already when you're purchasing it. So it's just kind of a thought that popped into my head sometimes. It, it may be uh, asking them to pay for any upgrade to that sidewalk that is required it based on the standards. Maybe something, something like that. to that. I just always, I'm always trying to think of terms and equity for development right. too, because I don't think it's fair to require. But it's a site amenity uh, similar yeah. to um, underground utilities. Yeah, you know? yeah. So when you buy a site, you say, okay, so, this is true. Package. So yeah. just strike that bar. Although I will say that given, I work with what's some of the property owners mm -hmm. um, when the dance was trying to negotiate putting the sidewalks in and some of them were yeah not cooperative and i'm like if you're not cooperative with what they're trying to do and put sidewalk in front of your company then i feel like they shouldn't benefit but that's just i know i know and that's one the problem where where issue, issue, and i should i just them. barely had to do that with you and that's probably where the thought popped in my head like, <laughs> i should have to pay yeah exactly but Question. But yes, that was just. I don't. We can't require this, but as we continue to move forward into the electrical vehicles, are you seeing new projects wanting to designate, you know, five or six spaces with electrical charging stations that you know, that would be exclusive for that use? They well, they have to have them. They have to have a certain number of required EV. Oh, do they? We do. And, we and, have and, and a certain um, number for future beginning of the year TV as well. I mean, I a new development uh -huh. gets to have charging. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. Depends on um the type of development and then um, how many spaces. Yeah. Oh, it's the third but she needed she their hospital equipment division and she's in New Mexico this week. And she couldn't find a place to charge her car. Yeah. Except these little various she, 52 minutes and she got 20% charge. Yeah. yeah. So you now, that's good. The town has an ordinance that they adopted. Um, so there's different levels about capable with um, ready. So some things are just okay. conduit, some things are good. just conduit and uh, electrical capabilities and then some are just fine. Like a hotel, a new hotel is, yeah. uh, what is it, is 100% ready and- So the X number of spaces that they, yeah. actual charging stations, that's enough. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, uh, in in the downs, yeah, yeah, in, in the downs, most of their apartment buildings that have, um, they have garages. The right. garages have a conduit, so that people, especially for the condos, so that people could, could uh, complete it and charge their cars. Right. Well, good. And we haven't had a lot of uh, kickback because they come in and we tell them what they have to do, and they're like, okay, cool. I well, find that if you just tell people what they have to do, it's very clear. All right. It's the arbitrary that conversations be, that are hard. I go to Costco and I'll shop and plug my car and all day. I don't want to talk about Costco in there. Yeah, that's a sad stuff. example. Yes. Okay. But yes, you can They'd do be that. The importance. <laughs> Time check. We got just over 15 mm -hmm. minutes. Okay. Do you want to wrap up this part and then move on to other things? Yeah, or? that would be great. I yeah. didn't think we would get. This was yeah. just really kicking this conversation off. Um, this has all been really good discussion. And Can we, if we haven't already finished the public sidewalks. Sure, sure. Right there, right so we're down to the point where I feel like this wherever possible should be 
Yeah. Shall be provided throughout. Yes. Strike them wherever um, possible. We will definitely update this or take this away um, that you don't have to follow a plan. Maybe it's just we have sidewalk requirements. And then we have where the sidewalk should be constructed, obviously in the right of way, unless the right of way width is not large enough. And then this is good language. It just requires. Um, where that should be refers back to landscaping. And then we have coordination with the site plan. Well, that's fine. And then this is the crosswalk language. So where sidewalks intersect with commercial drives or roads, crosswalks shall be inside installed to alert the murderers. Mo I can't read this word, sorry. The motorist and improved visibility crosswalk shall offer a noticeable change in color and material should be highly durable and slip resistant. So this is even right away possible um, from going across. So is there anything in there I'm comfortable with all that? I think once we beef up and say sidewalks are required, we're pretty much covered. So in summary, what I got from this conversation is we want to um, we we want to make new development commercial and multifamily be closer to the streets. We want it to um, engage with the street entrances and activity. We want parking on the side and the back. We want sidewalks required and we want to look at our parking requirements to really determine um, what those are and what counts. That's sort of a synopsis of what we had. Mm -hmm. Great. Autumn, I just have a quick question mm -hmm. on the transportation study that's mm -hmm. going to happen. Um, are they going to do a map of where we have gaps in yes. the sidewalks? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. It'll be a fantastic development tool. We pull okay. out our map, and it'll be great too, um, because we're doing also doing the conservation open space plan, which leads me into a staff comment. Right. Once you want to move on, well, we get there. <laughs> Eric, do we have any public on? Uh, no one on at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. So. You wanted to bring up landscaping in your particular piece of staff updates. Right. So landscaping standards, which we all um, moved forward to the ordinance committee in October. The meeting was very short, so I didn't get to have a full review with them, but they looked at our plant list and they were like, yeah, whatever. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that's just right. how it kind of worked out. But, after that, when remember I told you in August I'd reached out to professionals and didn't get anything, didn't remind them. Well, lo and behold, after it's done, I got a lot of input. And I have to, <laughs> it's always a way. Yeah, I, I got a lot of panic input. And I had a really good uh, conversation with landscape architects, um, some nurserymen, um, some professionals, and um, the our retired arborists from Portland. Really good conversation. Um, that would lead to that plant list being just tweaked a little bit in areas, but more allowances made in terms of perennials and uh, shrubs. And so really down in the weeds, pardon the pun. Um, but I wasn't <laughs> prepared. Landscaping has been a struggle for me because we, we get this constant on the planning board. So invasive species, is different from non-natives. And right. we keep having this conversation. Eric and I are put in really uncomfortable situations where we have to do all this, but there's so many plants that are permitted. This is a long time. I'm sorry, I'm making this long. <laughs> they also volunteer to come back and have some conversations and do a workshop with our planning board or this committee. And so I wonder at this point, if we shouldn't take a step back, how you feel about that? and maybe um, try to arrange a conversation with this group? Or would you all just like to say, no, nah, we're done with it. You go have your conversation with the Ordinance Committee and planning. No, I'm not clear what the issue is. They want to add more shrubs. They want to add more plants. I'm not following the non-native versus invasive. But we, we established some sort of we, percentage for native. I, I guess, as I look at not the, the term non-native, there's an awful lot of plants that we use that came to the United States with the pilgrims, basically. Or tulips, for instance. Like tulips and daffodils. Those are non-native, technically. 
because they were imported from a different country. So how long does something have to be here <laughs> before it's considered native? So we have some folks that are very clear, non-native means non-native. If it didn't start here, we don't want it. And then I'm looking at the fact that we would have maybe five plants that they could use. Um, so that becomes a constant struggle. Some of the plants that we're familiar with, and it also tends to uh, be applied to grasses because you know the seeds from grasses blow. So they could end up in a the street. They could, they could end up in, in the marsh. Um, but the, the grasses, some of them come from Colorado in the, the plains and some of them come from the South. And New England didn't have a hell of a lot of grasses that weren't actually part of the salt water system. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a, I, at the planning board, we have a, a constant niggling around what's native and what's non-native and drives me batty um, because I look at the species that are common to us now and say, yeah, geez, my, lot, my yard is full of non-native plants. Um, but anybody looking at them, if I pointed to a hydrangea and said, look, do you like this? Yes, it's non-native. But it's so, as opposed to invasive. And, 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 and invasive, and, there's a clear list. And there's a clear definition. And a clear right, definition. Right, right. Okay. So and there is not a clear invasive, definition of non-native. So my real question is, are you guys kind of done with landscaping? And if I move it forward and have some additional conversations with ordinance and this professional group and planning board, and we tweak a few things, are you okay with that? Or do you want to be part of that? Go for it. I just so and I'll keep you abreast of any yeah. changes, maybe. Personally, I do not need to be involved. I <laughs> kind of thought that, but I did want to check because you know, with the new council um, set up, they'll do new committees, and ordinance committee probably won't meet again until January. And so I really felt like ah, I wanted to get landscaping done, but I missed it because I didn't get to have that it, October. I I don't. You're gonna see it again. <laughs> well, can, I, can, can it, but I, I, I don't think in a way that the, the planning board needs to be involved with with the new list. We need to we we take the list you give us and the yeah, from for the ordinance, okay. and, and that's and that's fine. Okay. Can't uh, the the, 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 the concern comes when somebody then starts to pick at that list. Yeah. In the middle of a meeting. Well, and that's the thing. So. What my plan is, and I've talked with Nick McGee and April about this a bit too. Um, so do you care if I tweak what you all have proposed based on my conversations with professionals after the fact? And I'm like, go for it. We don't care. Um, so do you care? I'm going to tweak it a little bit and then I'm going to change and I'm going to have these conversations so I don't have this, oh my gosh, Scarborough is the devil and it doesn't get approved at all. So I, I, I generally that. don't change what a professional traffic is. That's sort of time. what I want. So That's what I, I can say. say but, but, um, okay. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll, we just want to get into threats. <laughs> I, I wouldn't focus on not native. I would focus on native, invasive, and everything else is one of them. That's sort of what I... I the, the term I spend a lot of time in the conservation world uh, Non-native is not a term that I hear kicked around a lot. So if somebody's telling you non-native, I can say, no, we, let's push that. Okay. 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 That's okay. I'm just, I'll just yeah, proceed and let you guys know how it's going to And, and, and then in terms, that it, should be our list. I, I would say because there are changes that come along and changes that might be coming along with climate change, um, that a, a tweak to a landscaping list might come to us, but is relatively minor. Um, sure. But certainly, if a if a species is declared invasive, Everybody take said. it off the list. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let us know. Okay. But say it's off the list. And I'm saying, and I'm saying, anybody coming with you to you with non-native as a term, to my way of thinking, in my experience, is a canard. They're talking about something else. Right. Yeah. And that's free yeah, advice. That's and we're we good. struggle with, we get a whole like, well, if it's non native domain, it's invasive. 
Right on. And that's, 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 that's not true. Well, I, I know it's not true, but it comes, oh, okay. it comes right. to us. It's a right. constant. No, I, I just am saying they're trying yeah. to, it's a smokescreen. It's yeah, not, yeah. It's I, sort of not a real trend in my experience. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Anything else? Um, uh, yes, for staff updates. So we just, um, council on the 8th, approved the formation of the ad hoc open space committee. And so we're putting out a request for proposals probably in December for our open space. And I don't know if you all recall, but we, the council adopted a resolution to try to be 30% uh, preserved open space by 2030. And so this is part of that. We'll be putting together this open space plan with a consultant, um, really taking a look at what we have, how we define open space, any sort of implementation that can change, you know, ordinance changes, all that. So it'd be a pretty fun project. And I'm the committee uh, liaison because I needed another committee. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, it'll be me and Jamie and Jamie Fitch, our sustainability, sustainability coordinator, and then Angel Park, probably uh, here, and then Eric. You know, um, Years ago, Sue Office and I chaired the open space. You had the committee. exact same thing, yeah. And there was a report. Yeah. Okay. So this is a new version of that. Yes. Um, and so they'll there will be nine voting members. Uh, the conservation commission will appoint a member, Parks and Conservation Land Board, Community Services, Advisory Committee, and the Long Range Planning Committee will appoint a person. We'll also have one from Shellfish, Coastal Waters and Harbor Advisory, Scarborough Land Trust, Friends of Scarborough Marsh, Scarborough Fish and Game, and then a non-voting town tower. So a pretty diverse and really great group, I think, to work. Sounds great. So for December, I'd like you all to think about who you might want to appoint to Long Range, um, who might be interested, who might have the time. I envision it being from probably January to September. Um, Probably pretty busy group, maybe two meetings a month, um, maybe not, but um, I know the ad hoc open space committee is meeting quite a bit, but it will be consultant led, um, and so that'll be good. But this is a lot of a lot of diverse um, membership, <clears throat> and I think. No. I, you all are my favorite group because it's such a good oh, and I'm say that no you really are I think that outside of the group because it's such a wide range of perspectives and you all really collectively sort of help see different sides of things and I really appreciate that. So I think your role in this will be really important yeah. uh, to balance some of these other roles, right? Right. Could I ask Eric if he's doing the minutes? To kind of set that up bold faced yep. <laughs> in the minutes so that members who are not here can at least be alerted that we're looking for an individual and maybe somebody would want to raise their hand uh, in the process. So, and I will also send this out uh, next week to, to you guys all for everyone. I have Thank a couple of other committees within the group. So. I just wanted to put that out there for you to kind of get thinking about it. Yeah. This other thing, the horticultural thing, can wait until next week. Okay. Eric, I don't know if you have anything else. No, I'm all set. All right. Thank you. Kara? No, I think I'm good, other than Costco did open this morning. I guess they had 10,000 people sign up for cards before the doors opened. Um, so they're there was a line. How long was it, Alan? I think somebody oh, said it was around the building. It was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there were literally hundreds of people waiting to get in. Yeah. I think there's so, already yeah. card holders. It's, it was amazing or interesting. Right. Yeah, I, I heard that there was a discount offered today if you signed up today. But you can spend the whole last it's couple of weeks. Yes. Yeah. 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 They were encouraging people to buy the eight thousand dollar bottle of wine yeah. and the um, Louis Vuitton uh, suitcases, so that the uh, numbers for us go up. I beat the Scott the Florida store that just opened. Ah. I said I don't know how many people are going to be looking at those. I don't think that's what people go to Costco for, but you never know. Rachel, um, no, the uh, the planning board is going to go to monthly meetings, one month, one meeting per month, starting in January. Yep. 
Um, I think it's going to be doable. Uh, if we get overwhelmed with applications, uh, we might have to have a second meeting in a month to clear clear the decks. I, I don't think that's going to happen. They've been steady, but not overwhelming. Um, and that's a lot of that is due to the planning staff that's um, worked very hard to send something forward to us that's actually ready to be looked at, okay. as opposed to some speculative stuff that we have to spend too much time on and can't keep sending it back. So, okay. so once a month, every month? Once a month. Every yeah, month. Right. The third, is it the third Monday? The third Monday. The third yep. Monday. Except January. No, we were always, I, I mean, since 2004, it's been every three weeks. Yeah. So, the yeah. Concert, the, sorry, Rachel, the Conservation Commission is also going to change their meetings to the fourth Wednesday okay. so that they can coincide better and um, review, be a part of the development review okay. process better. Okay. Portia? Transportation. Well, actually, Marvin is the long range uh, person there, but as far as transportation, this we're moving along on the uh, transportation plan. We're still waiting for the feedback from the third and fourth portion of our public meeting, um, which is, you know, where people started from and where they wanted to go, and also identifying um, trail connection um, concerns. But the first part, I think we got plenty of feedback from mm -hmm. Vegas and it continues to come in. Mm -hmm. um, people are really interested in seeing it become a, you know, a nice entrance into the town and to be very accommodating for pedestrian and bicycle traffic as well. Please. Looking at Payne Road going. <laughs> yeah. 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 Marvin? Oh, uh, I, I pretty much covered some of the meeting for you uh, the uh, public input. Uh, aspects of it, and there was public comment during the meeting, transportation meeting, having to do with the current uh, ripple of uh, the school downs proposal, having to do with Maple Avenue and uh, people there. Uh, traffic calming was a traffic factor. calming, and it, uh, it was productive uh, as far as public input and the response by the professionals, uh, the staff. Um, uh, the chair of the uh, discussion about that. Good. Thank you. Great. No, good. Uh, uh, if I could just fill the Fox and Con I'm also on the Fox and Conservation Land Board, and we met yesterday. Um, we're revising the evaluation process for the purchase of property. Uh, it's, I think it was done last in 2002. So we kind of thought there have been some changes come along since then. But um, what we're aware of is that there are quite a few projects uh, that are in the pipeline from the land trust. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be very busy looking at the um, looking at the, the funding and whether we're going to need uh, some more funding in the future. But the, what's going on with the open space committee is very welcome because all of a sudden, after a, a real dry spell of purchase, we're starting to see a lot more coming through. Thank you. I got a couple things. One, the third Friday of next month is the 15th, just as a reminder to everybody. Um, we'll be back in public safety as well. We'll be back. We'll be back over there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just more on a personal level, no pressure, but I'd love to see you possibly reconsider extending. Oh, yeah. And that's just if you can I will make it happen. I will. I will. You have a lot of fun things to do. <laughs> well, I just, I, I, if this is an example of you coming in slow this morning, uh, <laughs> sorry. No, thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. And I will, I will have a uh, final uh, yeah. uh, decision uh, on the way of what you just recommended. I just like the opinions around the table, and I think there's some really good conversation that comes out of all of this. So just 
from right. where we're at. And unfortunately, we didn't see our new members. Today. No, no, and um, no more problem. But that's all. Um, Chair would entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, okay, we Rick first, Marvin second, and all those in favor. Aye. And I see that to be unanimous. Thank you all. I have a wonderful thing. Yeah. Thank you as well.